York, the timeless city, shines like the North Star in the firmament of English history. Yet most of those who visit see only a fraction of what the city has to offer. So varied are the sights and sounds of York that each unfolding season brings forth new treasures and indeed fresh views of those already well known. A case of familiarity breeding not contempt but a new fondness. When he was Duke of York, the future King George VI said, the history of York is the history of England. As the serried ranks of spring flowers bring life and colour to the city, the very banks in which they flourish are the defensive mounds created by the Normans when they took their turn as lords of a settlement which has outlasted all of its conquerors. Visitors can still stroll round the almost complete parapet walk, originally constructed in the 13th century, and enjoy a privileged view of the city from the greatest set of such fortifications in the country. Still very much in evidence are the four great entrances to the walled city, having survived all that time and the Victorians could threaten them with. Much was done in the last century to remove them in favour of improved traffic flow, but Micklegate Bar, Monkgate Bar, Bootham Bar and Warngate Bar have once again proved the true survivors. Wherever you view the scene from the vantage point of the walls, it is almost impossible to avoid the grandeur and majesty of the city's keeper. York Minster, although sometimes appearing a strangely subdued giant from afar, is a dominant and watchful sentinel as it stands proud above the huddled city skyline. The magnificent looming presence of the complex we see today was started in the 13th century and although work on a building of this scale is never really complete, the Minster would have been substantially recognisable as the medieval masterpiece we see today by the latter part of the 15th century. But even the grandeur of York Minster in the sunshine of a spring morning should not be allowed to detract from the quiet beauty of the many other fine buildings which have grown and flourished in its shadows. As the lengthening days bring added variety to the sights, so the number of visitors starts to increase. But not all visitors to the city are tourists. These one-time residents of ancient Jorvik regularly return to celebrate one of the most striking aspects of York's past as part of the annual Viking festivals. These colourful raiders from across the North Sea arrived in a York which had, following the departure of the Romans, developed into an Anglo-Saxon centre of religion and learning. But the Danes who sailed up the river were interested in more worldly prizes. Although in the great scheme of things their tenure of the city was not particularly long, it was they who developed York as an important trading centre. And in doing so, they not only stood York in good stead for centuries of dominating commerce in the north of England, but also, quite literally, laid the foundations of the city in terms of shape and character. Evidence of which can be seen at the world-famous Jorvik Viking Centre. The Vikings set out the framework of rambling, irregular trading streets which we still recognise as the heart of the city's unique character. The very names bear the stamp of their originators. The word gate is Old Norse for street, and Stonegate holds the mystic echo of something which modern shopping developments can only vainly try to imitate. Gudrum Gate features the oldest row of houses in the city and also many other ancient buildings with modern day functions. And around the edges of King's Square, the visitor can savour both the variety of goods on offer and the special ambience of a matchless trading place. Walking the busy streets, however, is not the only way to appreciate the ancient street plan. On a hot summer's day, the cooling breeze on an open-top bus can give a refreshingly different point of view in more ways than one. As well as passing many of the major attractions, 
This relaxing journey demonstrates in a very practical way how the old city layout has been adapted to accommodate contemporary traffic and how the internal combustion engine is sometimes diverted to suit the city. A first sight of Lendl Bridge is a timely reminder of how important the river has been in York's diverse history. A stark reminder also of what a hard taskmaster it can be. A force which initially brought prosperity to York can even now rise up to show its power to the descendants of those who tamed and employed it. Flood defences are continually being upgraded and improved, but at any time of the year, Britain's unpredictable weather can swell the usually benign waters and threaten all of the buildings which occupy the riverside. It's a very ill wind that blows no one any good and this particular seasonal transformation of a usual playground and the new brand of fun it offers merely leaves these young residents feeling as happy as a sandbag. In no time at all, things return to normal and the river itself becomes an excellent vantage point from which to view York's changing scene. It was the easily defensible position at the confluence of York's two rivers, the Ouse and the Foss, which encouraged the Romans to build the fortress that grew to become Ebor Arkham, their capital of Lower Britain, and the place where Constantine the Great was declared Emperor of Western Europe. The Vikings established, and the medieval merchants developed to an astonishing degree, the river as an artery of trade, and the flow of these waters once powered the wheels of woolen mills mills which provided much of the wealth of those early merchants. Unfortunately, its steady, reliable pace also sealed their fate. Increased mechanization needed a more rapid flow as its driving force, and the Industrial Revolution saw York's commercial strength diminish. Some cargoes are still carried to and from the city by barge, but in the main, the river is now most valued for recreation, to be treasured in its own right, and as yet another different lens through which to view the city's splendor away from the clamor of the streets. There was at one time plenty of clamour on the Knavesmire when it was the scene of public executions, most notably that of infamous highwayman and horseman Dick Turpin. But it's equine achievement of a different nature that draws the crowds today. From May to October each year, this fairest of Britain's tracks, recognised as a true test of a thoroughbred's worth and where the sport of kings has predominated since the 18th century, plays host to some of the showpiece races of the English calendar. One of the highlights is the High Summer Ebor meeting, which is as much a social occasion as a sporting event. Unfortunately, the odds of meeting a celebrity in the crowd are probably better than those of picking a winner, even with veteran jockey Lester Piggott aboard, a successful wager on your favourite is by no means a racing certainty. Other veterans on the Knavesmire are less interested in pure pace than in style and condition. These historic vehicles gather on the open public spaces where they rightly draw many admiring glances as part of an annual commemoration run. Carefully maintained by individuals and corporate enthusiasts alike, this parade of character and characters once again shows how dear York present holds all aspects of York past. The rolling acres of the Knavesmire also play host to such things as circuses, flea markets and exhibitions. 
not to mention the countless local football teams, kite flyers and dog walkers, all of which contribute to a much improved and more civilised atmosphere than that created by the public executioner. Back in the city centre, space is at much more of a premium, although there are one or two areas of peace, calm and tranquility, such as the imposing house and gardens originally provided for the treasurers of York Minster. Stark contrast to York's favourite and most famous street, the oldest and narrowest in the city, the Shambles. The name comes from the butcher's shelves or flesh hamels situated outside the shops which were used to display the butcher's wares. The closely confined nature of the buildings meant that the resulting shade was helpful in the conservation of the meat but necessitated the passing of a law prohibiting the storing of anything under the ledges so that children could seek refuge beneath in the event of approaching or runaway carts. On somewhat wider streets, horse-drawn transport is still in operation today and the easy pace offers the perfect way to appreciate some of York's most splendid buildings, like the lovingly restored Fairfax House or the stunning 14th century hall of the Merchant Adventurers, York's richest and most influential guild. It was the merchant adventurers who sponsored the export trade in wool with Europe and obviously the grounds of the guild's magnificent hall is somewhere the players in the York Early Music Festival would feel perfectly at home. One of the many regular features in the city's cultural calendar, this particular full costume performance is being enjoyed by both participants and spectators in the carefully tended grounds of the Yorkshire Museum. The museum gardens are an attraction in their own right, but also contain the remains of the Benedictine St Mary's Abbey, whilst the museum itself currently houses some of the most exciting Roman remains ever found in England. The musicians all play authentic, handmade copies of traditional instruments, often lovingly and painstakingly crafted by the players themselves. But York is not all history and antiquity. Many new projects are adding to the city's list of alternatives and they often slip seamlessly into the existing landscape. From the futuristic high-tech Barbican Centre, a flexible concept which is sports complex, conference and exhibition venue and modern concert hall, to Coppergate and St Mary's Square, a purpose-built precinct combining both retail and heritage interests. To within sight of the Minster, the Stonegate Centre, one of many developments which successfully blends the old with the new in the continuing York story. But these improvements are not mere cosmetic tinkering for the benefit of tourists. The main domestic shopping area, Parliament Street, and the open-air market have also been recipients of this forward-looking and positive approach to changing conditions. From the earliest of days there has been trading here in leather goods from riverside tanneries, axes from local forges, eastern spices and wine from the lowlands. The goods on offer may have changed but the activity remains the same, even if some of the advertising style has altered. Someone else who encouraged change was George Lehman, one of York's early railway pioneers. And his statue seems to indicate that he was remembered with more affection than the man known as the Railway King, locally born George Hudson, who, like Lehman, rose to prominence as both Lord Mayor and MP, but ended his career in some ignominy. Nevertheless, Hudson did bring the railway to York, 
and was instrumental in making the city once again a central pivot in the nation's commerce, helping to regain some of the ground lost to greater industrialization in other parts of Yorkshire. Structurally, the current station, opened in 1877, has changed very little and yet still functions efficiently as a mainline station on the London to Edinburgh line. The carefully preserved details feature the coats of arms of the three companies which eventually amalgamated to form the Northeastern Railway. The whole is almost worthy of being considered a working railway museum. On occasion, all routes seem to lead to York, and never is this more true than when the rightly celebrated York Cycle of Mystery Plays is being performed. Based on medieval cart plays and revived in the 1950s, a series of spectacular and successful productions have led to this unique local celebration becoming a world-renowned event often performed against the stunning backdrop of the ruined St. Mary's Abbey in the Museum Gardens, once one of the most powerful Benedictine establishments in the country until it fell foul of Henry VIII's dissolution of the great religious houses, this most special of productions features hundreds of local amateur performers and volunteers with traditionally one professional actor being invited to play Christ. The annual York Festival grew out of the revived quadrennial performances of the mystery plays, but now has its own special place in the York year. Less imposing, but no less striking than the ruins of St Mary's Abbey, are some of York's hidden treasures. Quiet walks and byways conceal an array of often overlooked delights. Tucked away in peaceful corners, those adventurous enough to stray from the tourist highways can enjoy the sights of countless generations. The imprint of many peoples have been left on the map of York, people with differing styles and varying beliefs. And many of these magical pockets of the past are linked by a fascinating network of snickets, ginnels and alleyways, whose very names are a catalogue of intrigue. Coffee Yard, Oglethorpe, Hole in the Wall, High Hungate and Mad Alice Yard. In York, even the obvious can be hidden, as this ancient Roman column often seems to be, situated as it is in the giant shadow of the minster. The onset of autumn, and with it, a relative calm descends on the ever-active city. The softer autumn light brings with it the perfect atmosphere to consider some of York's quieter corners, or look with new eyes on some now familiar scenes. Jacob's Well is said to be the priory house of York's second independent Benedictine settlement, sited on the opposite side of the river from St Mary's Abbey. Holy Trinity Church Micklegate now contains all that remains of the original Holy Trinity Priory founded in the 10th century, whilst in the churchyard the shape of these five-man stocks leaves us with a reminder of more worldly medieval matters. Occupying a site originally used by Augustinian friars, the Guildhall is a magnificent reconstruction of the original Common Hall, which was destroyed by fire in 1942. And York's magnificent mansion house, older than that even of London, is in all respects a true Lord Mayor's residence. And autumn shades sit equally well in the great Guild Church of All Saints on the pavement. 
as indeed they do on all of York's treasures. What better vantage point from which to view the softening cityscape than from atop Clifford's Tower in the aptly named Eye of York, close by the Castle Museum? The tower itself is only part of a once impressive fortification started by William the Conqueror. It has a mixed and unfortunate history. In the 12th century, severe anti-Jewish feeling led the persecuted minority to seek refuge in the tower. Here they were subject to an attack by the sheriff's men. A combination of mass suicide, fire and attacks on those who fled led to over 150 deaths. But time has softened the pain and the sturdy tower is now best appreciated for its unrivaled panorama of the city. On November the 5th each year, Clifford's Tower, along with the whole country, celebrates with bonfires and fireworks the discovery and foiling of the gunpowder plot. But the man who gave his name to the guy on the flames was a certain Guido Fawkes, born and raised in York, and not all the residents of the city at that time were against what he tried to do. Indeed, to this day, Pupils at St. Peter's, the school attended by Guy Fawkes, traditionally refrain from any celebration of bonfire night. Winter descends with the fall of the last rocket stick and for some the coming season is held to be the best time of all to view those familiar yet once again altered images. Residents of all sorts accommodate, reflect and enjoy the stillness and beauty of winter in this, the city they share with the world. Having seen others visit and enjoy the sights and sounds of this, their home, it is now their turn to enjoy the winter season, when shades of a pagan past mix with the commercial present in medieval streets watched over by the minster built to worship he whose birth Christmas celebrates.
at once fulfilled, fortified and rested by the winter's natural pause. Both city and inhabitants eagerly wait yet another year and the further variety its seasons will bring.